our knowledge of the state of the Homeric Iliad and Odyssey in pre-Hellenistic age derives from direct quotations and comments in other authors from numerous papyrus fragments found in Egypt and dated the earliest of them to around 300 BCE and from information preserved in the Homeric scholia on the work of the Alexandrian critics and the readings in their sources. This evidence suggests that in pre-Hellenistic and early Hellenistic times, the poems were preserved in various city editions, individual editions, and the so-called koinai. All these editions were marked by random interpolations, omissions, and variations in wording. Thus, in addition to attestations from Aristotle and the scholia referring to specific Homeric readings and explanations in a thoroughly scholarly context, evidence from Herodotus and Old Attic Comedy on Homeric textual criticism should also be considered crucial. This is not scholarly, but rather points to the increasing popularity and availability of epic, and perhaps not only epic, textual criticism. This paper will argue that various literary genres reflect the diffusion of Homeric criticism in the course of the fifth of and fourth century BCE. In my first uh, part, I will focus on texts which combine various Homeric errors and problems and distort them. And I call this uh, combination mythological burlesque. And in the second part, um, I will deal with Stratus comedy Phoenicidus, particularly fragment one, which represents a cook who is a talented rhetorician and who transforms his discourse into Homeric verses and vocabulary. Both late comedy and epic parody serve as important evidence for the context of Homeric textual transmission in the fourth century, particularly second half of the fourth century BCE. Parody was an important route for Homeric reception and critique. Such parody commenced considerably earlier with travesties of Homeric style dating to the 6th century BCE, the mock epic Margites and poets like Hipponax and Hegemon of Thassos. Those surviving textual evidence is not sufficient for further analysis. Archestratus of Gela from the first half of the 4th century BCE composed a humorous didactic poem, Hedupatia, in Hexameters, which parodied epic poetry. It incorporates distorted verses from the Homeric text or from other epic poets, such as the reversal of Homeric formula apoheira seale for laying hands upon food, etc. It also narrates gastronomic quests, in particular where to find the best food in the Mediterranean world. I have here the fragment 166, where Archestratus has the following to say about the Bonito, a member of the mackerel family that resembles the tuna. As for the Bonito in autumn, when the Pleiades set, prepare it in any way you wish. Why should I make a long story for you out of this? And this T soita de mutologeo is important because it's absolutely formulaic repetition of uh, Homeric verse. This is an evocation of Odyssey 12, 450, uh, where Odysseus declines to repeat the tale of his treatment at the hands of Calypso and says, uh, who loved and cared for me, why should I tell this you word for word? Ti toi ta de And toy here, importantly, this toy might uh, have been printed here as well, although Archestratus uses soy elsewhere. And in any case, we cannot know what form of the pronoun he knew from his text of Homer. In other words, when we use his text uh, for any author of the fourth century BCE, we mean the version of Homeric epics which they had in mind, be it in a written or in memorized form. Further on, Euboeus of Paros wrote perhaps four books of parodies with two fragments from the Heton Balaneon Mache, Battle of the Bathman, and two fragments surviving contain distorted Homeric verses, which I might very much comment on a, uh, later if we have enough time, because the most important author for Today, and most interesting example for uh, text transmission is uh, Matro of Pitane, of the second half of the fourth century, and uh, his poem Deipnon. The poem represents a, a glutinous hero wandering across a huge buffet. 
Matra undoubtedly knew the Homeric poems well and was capable of recalling phrases, verses, and even entire passages by memory. But it is hard to imagine that he did not occasionally consult a written text as well, although the verses we so what exactly is happening here with Homeric text. However, I threw away the seer chance with uproar as the rose waves always washed and they pulled from their head many spines out of the roots. Uh, first of all, in the first verse, verse 18, here is a humorous adaptation of Homeric long-haired long act, uh, which is with hair, uh, as opposed to tribes like what described as Akrokomoi, with first verse word whilst then uh, homar kare uh, is accusative of respect by commontas uh, but it's of course very slight uh, difference the next verse, uh, 19, uh, is uh, an evocation of Eliot 16, uh, 794. First of all, uh, the whole constitutes a composition of well-adapted uh, Iliadic verses, which evoke first the death of Patroclus, and the helmet produced a sharp sound as it was rolling rolled under the feet of the horses here. And then uh, the next uh, Achilles grief at Patroclus's death in Iliad 2361, in an open space where the sea's waves splashed over the seashore. And we will talk a bit about this from Cluseskon and uh, Cluseske in Matro and the difference. And now the last verse here is uh, Agamemnon's lamentation when he realizes that there is no obvious way to bring the war to a successful end. In Iliad 10, 15, he pulled from his head many hairs out of the roots. Apart from the evidence uh, use of the Iliad as the whole, the form Cluseske in verse 20 deserves particular attention. Matros Cluseske corresponds to the scholar reading, uh, scholar A, while the Vulgate reads Cluses Con. In fact, some ancient texts of Homer had Cluses Ke, the reading of A, C, and E. Uh, so the oldest manuscripts uh, uh, contain this tradition rather than Cluses Con at Iliad 2361, on which verse 20 is modeled. Matro is probably reproducing his exemplar of Homeric text. If that is the case, then the verse constitutes a rare example of literal quotation of Homer. Since the words can scarcely be taken as a description of any actual feature of the dinner party or its surroundings, they must be intended to be ridiculous. Importantly, there are several cases where Matro seems to follow his exemplar of Homeric epics against the Vulgate, uh, such as um, 500, uh, 34, verse 3, for I went there as well, and a great hunger followed with me. Uh, this verse is modeled on Odyssey 6, 164, for I went there as well, and many people followed with me. So, Polus de my hospital Laos, uh, versus Polus de my hospital Limos in uh, Matron. Kakese is the only example of crisis in the fragments. Kakese 
Te rather than the usual Kai Keise appears in some manuscripts at Odyssey 1. Uh, 260 and Odyssey 6164 and was presumably the reading in the text of Homer available to Metro. Although uh, Aristarchus later proscribed this and uh, other similar forms. Uh, next um, example 534. To them has been entrusted the great vault of the cook houses. Uh, it is a deliberately absurd adaptation of the description of the Homeric Horai who control the cloud gate of uh, heaven. The manuscripts of the exemplars of this verse have epi tetraptai, such as Iliad 5, 750, or 8, 394, uh, whilst the oldest manuscripts, ACE, again, had epi tetraphatai, and third person singular medio passive forms in atai and ato occur occasionally. However, an early epic and its Hellenistic adapters, it seems better to assume that this is what Matro read. And in his text of Homer, retaining the tradition, Epitetraphatai occurs um, in uh, Iliad 2, uh, 25 and 62, uh, has the sense have been entrusted. And another important example uh, is uh, 534 verse uh, 31, embracing the head of the horse mastering red mullet in his arms. It's adapted from Homer's description of Andromaher's mourning over the dead Hector at Iliad 24. 724, embracing the head of man slaughtering Hector in her arms. So Andra for Noyo versus Hippodamoyo. And Matros Hippodamoyo occurs in various also ancient manuscripts and has been printed in Martin West. And this is my um, line in the bottom. Uh, Martin West edition uh, prints the old manuscripts and actually Matros uh, of Pitana version. Although Androfonoyo had been considerably better attested later. Hippodamoyo was undoubtedly the reading found in Matros text of the poem, so fourth century version. Uh, Lines, um, the same fragment lines 95 to 97, a slave brought 13 ducks from Salamis from the sacred sea, very fat ones, which the cook served where the ranks of Athenians were reclining. Uh, it's um, an obvious adaptation of uh, Iliad 2, 557-58, where Ajax brought from the island of Salamis 12 of their galleys, led them and placed them where the ranks of Athenians were stationed. And verse uh, 558, on which uh, Matros 97 is modeled, was occasionally said to have been added to the text of Homer by Solon in order to lend support to Athens' claim to Salamis in a dispute with the Megarians. This is later tradition uh, um, attested in Plutarch and Strabon. Uh, this is one of the two earliest witnesses for the line referred but not quoted uh, in Aristotle's rhetoric, which was apparently so poorly attested in the manuscripts known to the Alexandrians that they expelled it from the text. Verse 96 interrupts the adaptation of two lines that were originally contiguous in Homer and is in fact clearly Matra's own creation, Lis Limnes es Hieres. Amalapionas, uh, how Mageros. It serves the specific purpose of producing a contextual appropriate link between uh, verses 95 and 97. The Homeric Vulgate has duo kaidekaneas, but Pamphilos apparently read tria kaideka scholae A, and Matra undoubtedly had trist kaideka rather than duo kaideka in his text of the poem. Matra is the earliest attestation for the much discussed verse Iliad 2, 558, and leading Ajax stationed them where the battle lines of the Athenians stood. This is attributed by the later tradition to uh, Solon as a favor made to the Athenians. 
Matthew's variant reads, uh, the cook served where the battle lines of the Athenians reclined. In all probability, matter altered the Homeric test, kate kento for Homeric histanto, as he knew it. The Homeric original at Iliad 2, 558 has histanto, but Greek diners reclined to eat and uh, Matro, while retaining Phalanges, has adapted the verse to reflect this fact. Matro worked with Homeric text on a more sophisticated level as well. In some places, he combined various passages being a predecessor to the Hellenistic poet Adoptus. To keep us within uh, time limits for this presentation, I will only mention in passing that verses 93 to 97 in Matro have been stitched together from two sections in different books of the Iliad 16 and two. Matra's parody can thus contribute in a significant way to our understanding of the history of the Homeric text and also to knowledge of the reception of the Iliad and the Odyssey in the pre-Alexandrian period. We cannot know to what extent Matra's readers were capable of solving the sophisticated puzzles he creates. Undoubtedly, these represent his own literary aesthetic viewpoints. Must also have built on ideas common to him. However, the very fact of citation of the Homeric text provides important information on the ways in which the text was heard and read by recipients in late classical times. And with here, I uh, come to the second part, uh, to the longest passage, 50 verses attesting to the interaction of Greek comedy with Homeric studies generally. And this is Traitor's Phenicides, fragment one. This depicts a cook who is a talented rhetorician and speaks in Homeric verses and vocabulary. The fragment is a monologue spoken by, by a housemaster who is complaining about his new cook. Uh, frankly, he does not understand a word of what his cook is saying. The housemaster inserts an, uh, an alleged dialogue into his monologue. At some point, says the housemaster, he became exhausted through the long quotations and complicated words employed by, he, by his cook. And this he could not understand. And he did know anything of the Homeric sacrificial rites the cook referred to either. I am a rather rustic man, thus converse simply with me, states the master, all in a manner rather reminiscent of Aristophanes' Tripsiades. This implies a difference in social registers, which uneducated people unable to follow obsolete Homeric language, which was anything but simple. Haplos being emphatically repeated in the passage in verses 2 and 25. The master asks the cook to speak more clearly and becomes desperate. Do you intend to ruin me in the Homeric way? Homeric glosses such as Merapes, Daitumonas, Melon, Ulohutai, I have here, yes, the example with Meropas. Uh, Pegos are brought onto the stage as material for jokes. Morphological forms are confused. The stupid master cannot recognize the Homeric imperfect mistulon and builds a plural mistila out of it. The cook makes a noteworthy admonition which sounds like the pompous paraphrase of a school teacher, watch that you do it in this way in the future. And this sounds odd in the context of a cook speaking to his master, but would sound natural in a school context with grammar teacher lecturing his student, an early version of Jeeves and Wooster paradigm. A further important piece of evidence for contemporary Homeric scholarship is provided uh, by the verses uh, 42 to 44. So one would have had to get the books of Philetas to look up what each of the phrases means, uh, the same fragment of Strato. We don't know exactly which books of Philetas are meant here. Philetas, a tutor of uh, Ptolemy I and Alexandria and a teacher of Xenodotus, probably returned to course prior to the foundation of the Alexandrian library. From the surviving fragments, it is hard to reconstruct Philetus' methodology, but the exegetical sorry, works Atactoiglossae and Hermeneia are important for his studies of Homer. Philetus' uh, Homeric treatment was still considered significant in Aristarchus' time, as revealed by Aristarchus' writing treatise against Philetus. 
Philetus seems to have exercised early scholarly practice and for the most part explained rare and obsolete Homeric words. Examples including Pella, uh, which Philetus explained as a Boeotian designation for a cup. On some occasions, Philetus's evidence is important for the status of early Homeric text transmission. According to the Homeric school, Aristarchus is said to have shortened two verses uh, Iliad 23, 332, and 33, or it was made as a turning post at the time of earlier man, and now swift footed divine Achilles appointed it to his end marker into one, or it was hard 50 land, but how Achilles appointed it to his end marker. Philetus's explanation of the obscure word skiros might imply it here that there was a Homeric reading available to him and perhaps Aristarchus at the time. If so, this was not only a conjecture for Aristarchus, but a received transmission. The scholarship of 4th century BCE reveals a general interest in classifying authors and genres, as well as employing close reading techniques to focus on disputed verses and obsolete words. Philetus's Homeric work was, we may thus posit, popular. Stratus fragment, a kind of reference book, perhaps a lexicon or encyclopedia is implied, in which the meaning t dunatai of Homeric words might have been explained. Castle Austin, in the edition of Strata, added three Homeric lines uh, that were preserved only in papyri to the fragment of Strata. For in the previous editions, only 47 verses were presented. And it seems to me that this scoundrel was a slave of some sort of rhapsode from his childhood, so that he has never been filled to the full with Homeric uh, uh, expressions. The embodied feeling and epiplemy is used with the genitive case in classical Greek to mean metaphorically to infect with, as some parallel passages suggest. The housemaster thus ascribes the erudition of his cook to his close relationship with the rhapsode using a derogative comic hapax rhapsodo to yutu. Re the uh, rhapsode infected the cook with Homeric phrases. Stratus fragment, along with epic parody, generally serves as important evidence for the narrative of epic text transmission, reception, and interpretation in the late fourth century BC. I deliberately distinguish here between comic engagement with Homeric epic and epic parody and comic engagement with Homeric scholarship. Homeric verses, as well as Homer as a poet, were constantly alluded to and played with on stage. It should be clear, however, that construction of scholarly discourse elicited a comic reaction, and this was a reaction both to Homeric criticism and comic creation of Homeric criticism. Stratus fragment constitutes an example of this category with the allusion to philetas and emphasized metatextual Homeric connotations, such as, do you know that Homer uses these words? Do you intend to ruin me in a Homeric way? He has been infected with Homeric expressions. The issues of Homeric studies were clearly recognizable to the audience of comedy. And I conclude, uh, parodic and comic Homer is not so radically different from ours that is possible to understand this as the product of a vibrant oral tradition unconditioned by the existence of a written text. Indeed, there is no evidence anywhere for wholesale addition of incidents or for occasional wild changes of plot in the late classical text of the poem of the sort one would expect where they still fundamentally oral. Comedic variants nonetheless all belong to the same formulaic system and produce the epic in the first place. And their origin is accordingly a matter of some importance. Because Greek education traditionally paid considerable attention to Homer, individual writers and thinkers may sometimes have been so well versed in the conventions of epic language that they spontaneously produced new versions of lines they quoted from memory. There are so many minor variants of an essentially oral type in our sources for the late classical text of the poem, that this seems an insufficient explanation of their presence, and many are probably better explained as products of living tradition of rhapsodic performance somehow converted into literary form. Unlike epic poets several centuries earlier who composed in a truly oral manner, 
rhapsodes in the classical period probably either memorized a written text or memorized performances by other singers, which uh, were themselves ultimately based on a written text. Precisely how the rhapsodes changed, made their way into written tradition remains obscure, but one obvious explanation is that performances of Homer were transcribed and passed on a subsequent copies of the text. I confront two aspects of the interaction of Homeric epic with the genre of parody and comedy. The verses are verified and comically distorted, but also discussed and clarified what brings us on the level of textual criticism. What is even more important for the text transmission that this stubborn dealing with Homeric text, which marks specifically epic parody, but also comedy, permitted us to open a door to the state of text in the pre-Hellenistic period before Alexandrian scholars took the decision to collate it and revise it, and a result of this cleaning some ancient readings, as we have seen, have uh, disappeared uh, forever. Parody and comedy retained and transmitted the treasure chest with earliest layers of Homeric textual heritage. Humor is thus our savior. Thank you. <laughs>